just heard a very beautiful song which was in Hindi, of course. The words were, God is with me or I am in the company of God. So what is the need to fear? Of course, there were many other things in this song, but that's the subject I'm going to take up today. <clears throat> Methods for overcoming fear. Fear is a very big weakness of the soul. It can also be called a vice. It's not an exaggeration, exaggeration to call fear a vice. Because any type of weakness in the soul is a vice. Just as when we say sex, lust, anger, greed, attachment, ego, all these are vices. And then sometimes laziness, carelessness, bossiness, you know, all these are vices too. Similarly, fear is a very big vice, a big weakness of the soul. It results due to lack of faith in the self, lack of self-respect, lack of faith in the Supreme, and so on. If you make a list, how does fear come or what is it due to? Definitely it is lack of all the values. And so easily we say, oh, I'm so afraid. I'm afraid to do this. Well, if we see the positive side of it, then maybe we are thinking of doing something wrong and then there is fear of doing wrong. That is a good fear because the soul is stopping. The, the inner conscience is stopping the soul rather to do that wrong act and therefore there is fear because it's against the conscience. But then fear as a weakness also comes because my determination is in there. Baba sometimes says, lack of determination leads to fear. So let us Make a list of all the different types of fears and how we can overcome them all. Because situation remains the same, but some people are able to face that boldly and some are not. For example, some people are so afraid of darkness. They're afraid to go in, into the darkness. While some don't get afraid. They say, oh, so what? Doesn't matter. Some people are afraid of big heights. You know, I know someone who has never traveled in an aeroplane. Never. She doesn't ever want to fly in an aeroplane and I asked her why? She said, I'm afraid <laughs> because of heights. What if I, if the aeroplane crashes? What 
uh, if something happens. But if you see that all these fears are ultimately leading to the fear of death, isn't it? Any type of fear. If it's fear of darkness, okay, why is there fear of darkness? If you ask someone, why are you afraid of darkness? Darkness is nothing actually. It doesn't really exist as, as something solid or tangible. It is actually the absence of light. So what is there to be afraid of? But then the answer comes, well, because it is dark, I may fall. So I'm afraid of breaking my leg. You know, it can go on and on. Okay, why are you afraid of breaking your leg? Oh, because if I break my leg, then I'll be stranded, I'll be in bed for so many months maybe. I'll not be able to do anything. Okay, why are you afraid of uh, heights? Because I may die. So ultimately, the fear is of death. Just as we talk about things in a positive way, for example, supposing someone says, I need money, I want money. Why do you want money? Why do you need it? It says, so that I can buy things for myself. Because I need them. Okay, why do you need to buy those things so that I may survive. And some may say it in the other way. I need that, I want that because I may, so that I may live comfortably. And why do you want to live comfortably? Ultimately the answer will be peace and happiness, which are the values of the soul. Hmm? We sometimes do a workshop on this. Supposing you think of anything physical, anything physical, and then what does that physical thing remind you of? You know, maybe it's a watch. Okay, you think of a watch. What does this remind you of? Then you'll say, it reminds me of time. What does time remind you of? You know, you can go on and on and on. Ultimately, you will come to some value. It's for everything. So from the physical thing, you go to the subtle thing, ultimately. So whatever we are afraid of, we may think it in a very gross way that this is something physical I'm afraid of. I'm afraid of a robber. Someone may rob me. I'm afraid, I'm afraid of even an ant, a cockroach. You know, sometimes people are afraid of cockroaches, these little worms, you know, and I'm just afraid. Why are you afraid? They are so innocent. What will they do to you? But no, I ask someone, why are you afraid of this little worm? Oh, it's so dirty. <laughs> it's so dirty. I mean, well, it's supposed to be in the mud all the time, but why are you afraid? It's dirty, okay, but why are you afraid? Oh, supposing it hurts me, you know? Then they can go on. Supposing it's poisonous, supposing ultimately say, oh, supposing I die, you know? So the ultimate fear is the fear of death. If we think of any type of fear, we will reach to the last answer that is death. But if we want to overcome this fear, let us start from there. When I have this knowledge of the self that I never die, it's such a beautiful feeling. I'm eternal, just imagine. Not only I will never die, but also I was never born. And because I was never born, I will never die. Anything which is born 
has to die one day. Nothing physical in this world is eternal in the same way. Because when we talk about nature, nature's other word is something which is always in motion, always changing. Electrons, protons, you know, an atom, they're always in motion. So nothing is stationary. And therefore the other name for nature is change. Therefore in business management they have a phrase. They say everything changes in this world except change. Huh? Except change. You can't change change. The change is inevitable. It is always there. You can't change it. Every moment there is a change. But I am eternal. Physically, I never change. Even if somebody would want to burn this body, want to some die, you know, make, die, kill someone alive, just burn, his, burn him. Well, the body may burn, but the soul will fly away. It can't burn. Somebody may kill someone, shoot someone. Well, the body may die, but the soul will fly away. So I am eternal. Baba sometimes says, even if you have to die, it doesn't matter, but don't lose your happiness. Happiness is more important than even death. Why? Because you'll get another body, it doesn't matter. It's going to come, but your happiness is the value of the soul which cannot be brought back easily. And in order to overcome this fear, the greatest thought would be to keep this consciousness all the time that I am an eternal being. I was never born and I'm never going to die. You know, in golden age, the deities are called immortal. Why are they called immortal? Not that they don't leave the body. They do leave the body. That is, death is inevitable for everyone, the one who has taken a body. But why are they called immortal? Immortal not because they don't leave the body. Immortal because of many other reasons. The first reason is that they have the knowledge of the immortal soul. The deities have the knowledge of the immortal soul. In today's world, the bodily beings who are so body conscious, they do not have this knowledge of the immortal soul, though they do say, you know, they remember the soul only at the time of someone's death. When someone dies, the first prayer they will do is, Oh God, may his soul rest in peace. You know, The body is already resting in peace. It's there, resting in peace. But still, people pray to God for the peace of the soul. Therefore, we can say that Today there is fear of death. The first reason is because there's ignorance of the knowledge of the soul. The, the thought of a soul comes only when someone dies. You say left for heavenly abode. So who left? The body is there. It's not very definite in any religion about the soul, how it exists, where it exists, where it goes. In many religions, they believe that the soul remains with the body, you know, when the body is buried. The soul remains there, and then the time of segregation, when God will come, then he will liberate the souls. Well, the bodies won't, be, won't go because they will disintegrate and mix with the elements of the body, but yes, they think the soul will go at that time, when God will come to take back the souls. Or, he, or they say, God, 
makes the dead become alive. Well, the bodies will not become alive after 1,000 years or anything. In the olden days, they used to embalm the bodies, the mummies, embalmed bodies. And they thought maybe one day they will become alive. But we know that in this way, life won't come back. Many, many scientists are trying to find out the reason, the cause why death occurs. And what could they do to make someone alive and or immortal, you know, live forever? But Baba says, this is like interfering in God's work. Actually, the one who has come in this world has to go one day. What if no one would die? I mean, just imagine. What would happen? What would happen if there would be only birth and birth and birth and no death? What would happen? Can you imagine? Huh? What if there would be no retirement after 58 years or 60 years? Then how would other people get the seat? How would there be progress? The older ones would occupy everything, you know, and not give chance to the younger ones. So, this is the law of nature. If everything goes through its golden, silver, copper, iron stages. So the body has to deteriorate. But I am eternal. This consciousness makes me young forever in that way. So in golden age, the knowledge of the soul as an immortal, eternal being is very much there in a very natural way. It's not being told there again and again, just as we give the knowledge here or we read it, I'm a soul, Baba keeps telling us, children, be soul conscious, children, be soul conscious. In golden age, the deities won't remind each other, are you soul conscious? Are you soul conscious? No. They are naturally soul conscious. Or they won't even tell them that you have, you have to be soul conscious. So whatever knowledge Baba gives us here is in a natural form in golden age. But when does this knowledge emerge? It is there in a natural form without mentioning it. But when does this knowledge emerge? when the soul is to leave the body. The soul realizes that now this body has become old, I have to relinquish it, it I have to uh, leave it. And it gets a vision of a new babe, born baby. And it gets that feeling that I, a point of light, I'm leaving this body and I'll enter that newborn baby body newborn baby's body. And, but I am eternal. So this consciousness is so strong in them at the time of leaving the body that they leave the body at their own will with, the, with that right consciousness and that detachment. But now it's time for me to renounce these old clothes. And because the new body is there in front of that person, that soul, there's no fear. It's like, as Baba says, changing the costume. But here in Kalyug, it's not like that. That's why the fear. There is, uh, first of all, the fear of leaving the body because the soul is so attached to the body. You know, it's just like wearing very tight clothes, such tight clothes and uh, you have to remove them because they're dirty, whatever. You sometimes will feel lazy to remove them because they're so tight and then to remove them it's such hard work. But if they are loose clothes, hmm, then so easy to remove. Tight pants, so difficult to remove. But loose, okay. Therefore, soul consciousness enables us to be detached from the body and therefore we are like loosening our costume. In a second I can go beyond, I'm a soul seated here in the center of my forehead 
am the master of my senses. So that's what we do in yoga, is it not? And I have the knowledge that I'm an entity separate from the body. So in golden age, this knowledge is very much there. And therefore, there's no fear of death. And that's why the deities are called immortal. Secondly, the fear of death comes because there, is a, there are attachments. And death means renouncing or leaving everything behind. Attachments are the greatest cause of fear. What if I lose it? What if it is taken away from me? Possessiveness and attachments are the greatest, are the second greatest, I should say, cause of fear. And here Baba is teaching us how to overcome attachments. Why does Baba say that children consider everything to belong to me? It is Baba's, it is not mine, it belongs to Baba. So if something belongs to someone else, you don't get afraid of losing it, you know. It's so natural. It's just like, supposing, a very interesting things happen, I don't know if it happens in your countries too. In the train, someone starts shouting, oh, my suitcase is stolen, my suitcase is stolen. Someone took away my bag, someone took away my purse, it's not there. And all of a sudden, the first thought will come, I'll go and check my bag. Hope it's safe. <laughs> then I say, yes, my suitcase is safe, my bag is safe. And then, okay, okay, what happened? But that fear is not there. The instant fear comes because I'm afraid maybe mine is stolen away too. Therefore, the fear of losing because of attachment is the second cause of fear of death. Naturally, when the soul leaves the body, everything has to be left behind. Nothing is carried away. I tell you a very interesting incident of an old lady. She was so attached to her possessions. Maybe she had gold, she had diamonds, she had lots of wealth. And they were all put away in a cupboard, a very powerful, strong locker. And she was growing very old. Her children asked her, where is the key to this locker? Give the key. They, she refused to give the key. She never told anyone where the key was. And she was reaching her deathbed, you know, read that she was on deathbed. And her children asking her, where is the key? They didn't care whether she died or not, but then they wanted the key. But still she did not. So this is a true story. And ultimately she died. Huh? Of course, everyone has to die. So they didn't really cry over her death, but then after she died, the very thought, where is the key? And they examined her body. Well, now she's dead. So she can't say, don't touch me. And the key was found, you know where? In the petticoat, you know? Hmm. The sisters wear the skirt, and in the skirt uh, elastic or the band, it was, you know, tied in that. And maybe every day when she was changing her skirt, she was taking it out and putting it here, so where else will it go? She's dead. Now she can't tell anyone, don't take it, who are you to touch me? She's dead. So ultimately, she didn't take anything with her. But I'm sure the last thought must have been that, oh, I hope nobody takes away my key. Mm -hmm. There's an interesting joke on this. Once there was a very big miser. He was a miser, a stingy person. He had lots of wealth. Maybe it's a true story. He had lots of wealth, but he did not tell anyone. And when he was about to die, his children asked him, where is all the money? 
but he did not answer and he wanted to say but he couldn't speak his uh, voice stopped you know he just could just couldn't say anything then the children were wanting to him to say something because he probably wanted to say where the money was as he was dying but he couldn't speak so they called the doctor and said please do something so that he's at least able to say where the money is kept and the doctors you know they gave him some injection and then he came back into consciousness but they were staying in a village and in the village you know the cows the sheep and all the buffalo all the animals also live in the family like that so a baby cow means the calf was chewing a broom was chewing a broom you know chewing sometimes they chew things like that so he became conscious and he said oh broom 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 you know that means please save that broom from that calf because it is chewing it and broom 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 and he died <laughs> she so what was the last thought the broom just imagine the sweeping you know for sweeping they use the broom so the last thought was that just imagine that's why a dying man is told remember god now remember god don't remember any human beings remember god but the one who has never remembered god in his whole lifetime naturally he will not be able to at the end anyway and that fear will remain and he'll die with that fear and the last thought has a very important role to play for his next birth also you know so that's why baba says you have to renounce the attachments that will be your last test because what will be your last thought when you leave the body will it be only baba or none other and none other or will it be any bodily being or object or anything actually objects can be easily forgotten things of this world they can be easily you know not remembered but human beings with whom there are so many bodily connections relationships and uh, karmic accounts they have to be forgotten too and just one baba point of light and none other that's the biggest test i tell you my incident my example you know once we were traveling in a car and all of a sudden someone appeared on the road you know from nowhere he just came and the driver tried to give a very strong brake but somehow he couldn't apply a brake and uh, he just turned the wheel you know in order to save that person and he just turned the wheel and he turned it so heavily so strongly that the axle broke something happened and all of a sudden we felt finish that's the end of us because there was a very very deep you know like a valley on the left and or, and, or there was a very big uh, lamp post in front so the very thought must have could be that oh this is going to just fall into that big valley or the thought that will go and hit the lamp post anyway it made a big thud you know because that person's foot was touched and he fell down well he fell down and the car moved on the left and at that time i remember i was sitting at the back we were five of us sitting in the car i just closed my eyes <laughs> i said baba i'm coming to you like these were my words my my only thought baba i'm coming to you and i became so detached and after some time i opened my eyes i was very much alive <laughs> actually what had happened was that that, that car went and just uh, slept over the bushes there were thick bushes so it didn't go into that deep uh, that that 
pit or the valley, whatever. It didn't hit the lamppost. We were just a few inches away. And it just went and slept over those thick bushes. The wheel came out, the doors slammed open, and, um, and all that. But then, of course, we were all stuck in the car. We couldn't come out. We all, fall, we all fell on each other. And I got a slight bruise here, and uh, just a slight bruises. That's all. But like Baba took us in his arms, and all of us were saved. The, and that person who came in the way, he had uh, you know, some bamboos. He was carrying some wood on his shoulders. And uh, that, that wood fell. And it, it came and broke the window pane, the front window. And that window pane started crashing. It fell into pieces, you know, just like a rainfall. Like rainfall, it fell, small, small pieces. And those in the front were hurt a little bit. But we were at the back and we fell on top of each other. But then we, at the end, we looked at each other. All of us were safe. There was no blood, I mean, no, and not, not very serious injuries. And everyone was safe. And we said, Baba, we are with you. So the last thought which I got, I don't know, I didn't ask the other ones, but this was my thought, Baba, I'm coming to you. So what I'm trying to say is that how we have to have that practice of going beyond in a second, because that will be our last test. Supposing you hear a very tragic news, maybe it's something to do with you. Maybe the doctor tells me that I have cancer, supposing, I'm just saying. Diagnosis is done and I'm told that I have cancer. Well, it's a very big test. How will I take it? How will I take it? Hmm? Nowadays, the big disease of AIDS, every day on BBC it comes, how this big problem is increasing day by day, and how those with AIDS are considered as outcasts, you know, people are afraid to even go close to them. It's all ignorance, but that's, it, that's what it is. And supposing, I'm told for myself, how will I take it? Because on the BBC it comes that uh, they take interviews of those people and some of them are so brave, but some of them are crying and crying all the time. But how will we take it? I have come across so many Baba's children who have cancer, who have AIDS, I know. I've spoken to them. There is one sister, I don't know if she's still alive, but in Australia I went last year and doctors had given up hopes, but she was so brave, so brave. She couldn't eat and uh, you know her whole digestive system wasn't working well. She could hardly eat a little bit, just liquid food, but she was so brave. She said she used to come to the center every morning. I was wonderstruck. She said, no, this is giving me the strength. And, well, I was told a few months ago that she is in the same condition. It hasn't deteriorated. But then I knew of an instance of one patient. His doctor came to Madhuban to learn meditation. Usually it's patients who come to learn meditation because doctors advise the patients that uh, go to learn meditation, it will help you to overcome stress and all the anxiety and fear. But here it was the other way around. The doctor came to learn meditation and he got this uh, um, news from, message from his patient. Well, the story goes that that patient had cancer and the doctor had told him that you will not live for more than six months. That's your period. But this person had the determination to live. He said, I will live. And he, uh, he 
went for many meditations, but then ultimately he came to Raj Yoga meditation and he practiced meditation. He used to sit for hours in Baba's remembrance and so much faith in Baba. He had overcome the fear, everything. And he also went for other paths, you know. And after six months, when his doctor met him, he was surprised because because he never went to him back again, you know. And uh, he was taking other paths and learned meditation. And after six months when his doctor saw him, he, he was surprised and uh, he, the doctor asked him, how did you survive? He said, I'm learning meditation. So the doctor asked him, can I learn too? Because he used to go to other patients and whenever he would treat them, he would tell them, don't worry, you'll be all right, you'll be all right, don't worry. He used to tell his patients that way, don't worry. But one day, one patient got furious at him and said, doctor, every day you tell me the same thing, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. But tell me how not to worry. What should I do to not worry? Because that doctor will not know. He will just say, don't worry, everything will be all right. What do you mean by that? I have so many problems and every day you tell the same thing, don't worry, don't worry. So tell me, how will I be able to overcome all these problems if I'm not worrying? Well, this made the doctor to think that what should I tell such a patient how not to worry? Just saying don't worry is not enough. Anyway, so when this patient who became Baba's child and who used to practice meditation, who was given that date, uh, six months in time, and now he is back on the road, back on the track, and maybe his cancer is receding. So he, that patient told the doctor, you also go to learn meditation, go to Mount Abu. So he came to Mount Abu to learn meditation and he said this story narrated his experience in this way. So what I'm trying to say is that how Baba is teaching us all this. That's why people go for meditation, but the, it's very strange, why? Because when they go for meditation practice, they, the meditation practice which is usually taught in the world is go into nothingness, blank, become blank, blank, thoughtlessness or they just give a mantra, or they tell them to hold their breath, or just um, concentrate on their breath, that's all. The knowledge of the soul and the supreme soul is not given. And many are afraid to talk about God also in meditation, because they think, oh, if he belongs to another religion, maybe he doesn't uh, take this concept, and people won't come to learn meditation. So they avoid using soul, avoid using the word God, avoid using any spiritual terms. They take only on a very lokic, physical level. And the result is the inner strength is not received. Because they think all oh, this is part of religion, soul and supreme soul. And we tell them, no, this is the only answer. This is the missing link in every profession, in every act. This is a missing link, spirituality. Knowledge of soul, the supreme soul and the world cycle, drama. The knowledge of the drama helps us to overcome fear so easily. Children, Baba says, nothing is new. So why have fear? God is with you, why have fear? You are eternal, why have fear? It's so beautiful. So that eternity of the self and the company of the Supreme, that thought is never given to anyone. And the result is the fear is never overcome. And therefore, meditations don't help. Maybe they just help to relax at that moment, that's all. But later on, the problems are still there. So Baba says, you just rise above. How will you rise above? Actually, we are the cause of all of our problems. In today's Murli, it was there. You just rise, how do you rise above the problem? Don't be worried how this will happen, why it will happen, how and when. Yes, Baba will take care. 
What is the solution? What can I do to solve? Not, not think of the problems. That's why we say that uh, don't think of problems, but think of the solution. That is being positive. Problem is problem. It's there. You know, we say if there is a line, if you want to uh, make that line small, how will you make it small without rubbing it? How will you make it small? Huh? Draw a bigger line underneath. <laughs> if you draw a bigger line underneath, what will happen? That line will become small, very easy, no? Because everything in this world is relative, everything is relative, nothing is absolute. As I say, like this is a big hall, because in comparison to another which a hall, a hall which is smaller, this is a big hall. But in comparison to Om Shanti Bhavan Hall, this is a small hall. <laughs> So how will you say for this hall? Will you call it a big hall or a small hall? It's always in comparison. Only God is absolute, we say, because you can't compare anyone else with God. For souls also, we can say that we're all, you know, we have our uniqueness, but because we're all different. So in that way, soul is also absolute in that sense because there's no comparison. All are eternal souls. But we come in the cycle of birth and death, and therefore in this world there is relativity. And therefore the souls have to experience the relativity. But in my original nature, I am in my absolute self in the soul world. So knowledge of the self, the supreme, the cycle, the company of the supreme is, are such beautiful things. We say God's hand of protection is above my head. It's such a beautiful feeling to overcome any type of fear. Daddy Janki was telling us something interesting, you know, in this, uh, some days back before she went to Delhi, she visited Israel. And Israel, you know, is a Jew country. So uh, she was, she met a soul, hmm? yes? She met a soul who was telling her, because in uh, Ju Judaism, they wear a different type of a cap. So she was saying that he told her that this cap actually indicates God's hand of protection. This cap which I'm wearing is God's hand of protection. So because of uh, God's hand of protection, I feel I'm safe. So we always wear this little cap. So it's a good thing to feel that, is it not? That God's hand of protection is always on my head. I remember there was the governor of Rajasthan. He always used to carry a, a, a small, like a rod, you know, in his hand, always. He never was without that, that rod, or this size, maybe. And one day, someone asked him, why are you carrying this rod with you all the time? Because his wife said that even when he goes to the toilet, he has it with him. He goes to sleep, he keeps it with him, you know, always. He is never without it. And uh, so when he was asked, he said that uh, his guru had given it to him and said that this is going to protect you. Well, but then when he died, of course, the rod was with him. <laughs> He left his body. And it was, but one day he has to die anyway. Protection is not on a physical level. If I say, okay, God protects me, when one day if I am dying, if I, if I have to die, and I say, oh, God didn't protect me or what? Why did God not protect me? Why didn't Baba protect me? But maybe there is something better than this life which I have to go to that is even better for me. So that is why it's a benefit for me. So protection is not only on a physical level, protection of the soul, that is more important. Protection of our values. When I'm with Baba, I can not do anything which is not right for the soul. That's why we say, okay, this, this money belongs to Baba, so I can't use it in a wrong way. This body belongs to Baba. I cannot use this body for any impure action. Now, 
This is Baba's property. So this is a change in the consciousness which I have to keep in my mind all the time. But if it is time to leave the body, Baba will not save me. He won't say, no, no, okay, you are my child and therefore I'll save you. Baba won't interfere in my karma. But then some people question that, uh, then in what way does Baba help me? Baba helps me to give me the strength to face that situation bravely. You know? That strength comes. It's like uh, there are two patients. Both are having the same problem. Both are having the same type of pain. The intensity is the same, maybe. But one is shouting, oh, one is crying, and the other one is in silence, is, is bearing the pain. Now, pain is similar. But why the reaction is different? It's not that the, the other one is not getting the pain. But the first one is unable to bear it. The other one is able to bear it. The inner tolerance is there. Therefore, tolerance, patience, all these values, they come through meditation. And they come through meditation only when I'm in link with the bestower of these values. That's why Baba says, have your link with me. Always think that the bestower's hand is above my head. I'm, I'm never alone. So I was mentioning some points. Actually, there are many reasons why there is fear of death. One reason is fear of you know, dying, that's one fear, because the soul has to leave the body and the soul is so attached to the body that there's fear of being separated. It's a fear of <clears throat> removing the costume. The consciousness of the body is so strong. And the second fear is the fear because of attachments to, to objects. I'll be losing it. There's a very interesting joke on this. How are monkeys caught? You know, monkeys have lots of greed. And a very easy method for catching a monkey, catching hold of a monkey, you put a, something sticky underneath a pot and just stick that pot to the ground. And inside the pot, put some peanuts, which and that pot should have a very narrow, narrow neck. And the, the monkey comes, he puts his hand in that pot to, to hold the peanuts, and he has the peanuts in his hand. But he cannot take out his hand because the, the neck is very narrow. And then you try to catch hold of it, and, he, and that monkey wants to run, but with the pot, and the pot is stuck to the floor. And it, it won't run away because it wants those peanuts too. The attachment is there, the greed is there. And because of that, it won't run. And it cannot uh, uh, take, off the, take out the uh, pot and the result is it is caught. So Baba says, attachment and greed are the greatest causes of fear. But when we realize that I have no attachment to any bodily being, no greed, I don't want anything. I have everything. Because needs are okay, but wants are so many. Need, okay, I need food, that's fine, I'm getting it, but I want to eat the tastiest of food, the richest of food, well, then wants are too many. So this is the second reason. The second reason is attachments to objects. The third reason is attachments to bodily beings. As I mentioned, it's difficult to leave the attachment of bodily beings because karmic accounts are so strong. That's why Baba says, you don't have to become sannyasis and renounce your families, hearth and home and just become recluses, no. Because if there are karmic accounts to settle, they will 
pull your intellect back all the time. And therefore, renounce or finish, only when you finish the karmic accounts can you really become free. And Baba teaches us the method for finishing the karmic accounts through my remembrance. All my relationships are with Baba. I see all my other relationships and see them as souls. When I see them as souls and I also see Baba in between them and myself, then my karmic accounts can be settled very easily. I'm not giving anyone directly and I'm not taking directly from anyone. I give to Baba and Baba gives to him. Or he gives to Baba and Baba gives to me. So Baba is in between. So no direct karmic accounts are created. And through remembrance, I'm finishing off the karmic accounts and only then I can be freed of all attachments. Otherwise, bodily beings can pull the intellect very much. And therefore, Baba says, have all relationships with me. But it doesn't mean that I don't have to love souls. I love everyone. Not just this one because I have some relationship with this one. No, I have love for everyone. Hmm? Not I have love for everyone except this one. No. You know, somebody may say, I love the whole world except my neighbor. Yes? Or I don't like anybody except this one. No. I love everyone because all are Baba's children. And the fourth very important thing is why there's fear of death? Fear of the future. Future. There's always fear of the future. Future is in darkness. What will happen? What will happen? But at the confluence age, we know whatever will happen will always be for the better. My future is very bright. So why should I be afraid of the future? I have done good karm karmas in this life. And therefore, even if I have to leave the body now, I don't, I'm not afraid because my future will be better than this. So because of the faith in the future, there is no fear of death. In the world, there is even more fear because they actually frighten, you know, in Hindu philosophy, they say, you may go and become a pig, you may go and become a fish, you may go and become a dog or a cat, you know, 84 lakh species, they say. There is an interesting slogans on this. If at the time of leaving the body, you are remembering your wife, you know, they say, then you will go and become a prostitute in the next birth. If you remember your son at the time of dying, uh, you will go and become a pig in the next birth. If you remember money at the time of death, then you'll go and become a snake in the next birth, you know? In this way they frighten. Or you'll go and become a bird, you'll become this, you'll become that. But on the contrary, we say it's good, you know? They are, they are better off than human beings today. Very interesting thing is that once we had kept uh, an essay, comp uh, elocution competition for little children, speech competition, and the topic was, what am I going, uh, what do I want to become? Or what is my aim and objective of life? Something like that. And it was for little children, seven year old up to 10 year old children. So, one child came up, she was very smart, I think she was hardly six, seven years old. And she carried a, a flower, a rose flower in her hand. And she said, I want to become this. I want to become a rose flower. Why do you want to become a rose flower? Then she gave a long list of why she wanted to become, because of its beauty, because of its color, because it's always uh, giving away, giving everything, giving. So it's giving. Therefore, I want to become like a flower, all the values of a flower. One little boy came up and he, he brought a, a toy bird. And, he, and what he did as he came, 
He pushed the button and that bird flew, toy bird. He said, I want to become a bird. And one interesting point he gave in his speech was, which was actually the, that uh, it was meant to be for, the, for those days because America had put a sky lab in the sky, a laboratory in the sky. This was many years ago. And the laboratory broke, sky lab broke in space. And the pieces of that sky lab were falling on Earth. In Australia, there was great fear, oh, it may fall on my head, it may fall on my head. And people were told not to go out because that sky lab is falling, those pieces may fall on your head. So this boy, when he was speaking, he was giving his talk, he said, I want to become a, like a bird, a bird. Why? Because this bird is not afraid of the sky lab falling. It's, it is flying in the sky without the fear. It is flying fearlessly, and therefore I want to become like this bird, fearless. Well, this was just a point. But what I'm trying to say is that fear of the future is a biggest fear. And Baba has finished that fear. That's why in golden age this fear isn't there. Because the soul knows that I'll go and take a new body. Even, at, even now in Kali Yuga, you know, many yogi souls, yogi souls who are, who, are, who are really very strong, powerful, not in Baba's family, Baba's children, but even Lokik, they are hot yogis and they know how to conquer the ego of the body. Some saints, they get the feeling beforehand that they are going to leave the body. And they tell their disciples, that on such and such date, at such and such time, in such and such place, I will leave my body. And they lie down with all their followers and disciples in front of them. They give them drishti and then they say goodbye and leave the body. Yes, there are instances. So in Kali Yuga, if such instances could happen in golden age, Everyone experiences that. They die, leave the body at their will. And that's why Baba says that it's like relinquishing the old coil, you know, like molting of a snake. Have you ever seen snakes molting? Inside there is a new skin and the old skin gets shut, like torn like and just comes out and uh, it leaves that uh, behind like a trail trailer like or like a tail behind and then that snake moves forward with the new skin underneath because what happens inside that the snake is growing but the external skin doesn't grow so that dies off gradually and internally it gets a whole new skin and that's why it's able to leave the whole skin behind and therefore we say it's not death, it's just leaving the old skin and taking a new skin. Body is a skin, no? Like. So Baba says in Satyuk there is no fear because they leave the body at their own will. And this is the fourth reason. The fifth reason why there is fear of death is it's because of all the sinful actions committed in life. People are afraid, the soul knows it's going to get punishment for all those sins. Baba sometimes says that the soul at the end, you know, while leaving the body, gets all those thoughts, those feelings of what wrong actions it did in its lifetime. That's why some people cry at the time of death because those scenes appear in front of them and they know that they are going to be punished for that. And that's why Baba says at the end too, some souls will, will only be crying because they did not do much, they did not make any efforts, they had committed so many sinful actions, so they know they're going, we're going to be punished. But those who have finished off all their sinful actions or absolved all their past sinful actions, they'll go back purified, they'll go with honor, with respect, even Dharamraj, 
will respect them. You know, when we go to prison sometimes to tie rakhi to the prisoners, in India it's very common now. In every town, every big city, Baba's children go to the prisons to tie rakhis, you know, to the prisoners. And, uh, and we see the difference, the contrast, how the prisoners, how they are, you know, uh, they have to be so careful. The police is there, very vigilant to make sure that the, the, that um, prisoner is not running away or all that. And uh, they keep hold of everything. They are, they are under protection. But then when Baba's children go, they give us so much respect, so much honor. Sometimes they even salute to us because the jailer, the prison superintendent is with us, so they salute sometimes. But those prisoners there, they are so afraid, so afraid because they may be punished, they may be beaten, they may be you know, scolded, what not. But how God's children go with that respect. It's a great contrast, it's beautiful to see. So Baba says at the end too in Dharam Raj Puri, those who have committed sinful actions, how they will go with so much fear. But Baba's children who have purified themselves through yoga, who have um, absolved all their past, they are going back totally clean and pure. They will go with so much respect, having accumulated all the righteous actions so that they may enter into golden age. But those who have not accumulated righteous, righteous actions, they'll go back empty-handed because they don't, they're not able to carry the sinful actions to Paramdham anyway. So, fear of the punishment of sinful actions done in life. And the sixth reason, very important again, the fear of loneliness, being alone, helplessness in that loneliness stage. Helpless. They can't do anything. The body is totally helpless. No strength whatsoever. And here Baba says, you are never alone. Baba is with you. God is with you. It's such a beautiful feeling. And therefore that consciousness has to be kept all the time. The practice of Baba's company all the time should be there. Sometimes Baba says, see that point of light in front of your eyes all the time. That's Baba with you. Sometimes Baba says that point of light is in your eyes. Baba is in your eyes, you know. That's why in bhakti, you know, why they say God is omnipresent? Because some of them see their personal gods or whomever they have faith in their eyes. As if that God is in their eyes. So naturally, whatever is in their eyes, they see everywhere, you know. If I have green glasses on, I'll see green everywhere. If I have red glasses on, I'll see red everywhere. There is an interesting joke on this. Once it was, it came in the newspaper. Someone came to someone and said, I can uh, give, you know, I can make this whole lawn of yours green. In, uh, in one instance, I can make it all green. And that person said, really? How much money will you take? He said, 50 rupees. And everything I can make it, I can make green. And said, okay. Take the 50 rupees and he gave him a green goggle, green glasses and said, okay, wear this and you'll see everything green. So actually, if I, whatever I have in my eyes, I'll see only that. No? So if I have Baba in my eyes, then what will I see? Just Baba. Actually, this concept of God is omnipresence. How did it come? at the beginning of Copper Age. How did it all start? Because of faith and love for God. This was the first reason, one reason. If I have love for someone, I'll see him everywhere because he's in my eyes. Secondly, the devotees used to get visions of their personal gods. 
They used to get their visions every whenever they would remember them, the vision, their vision would appear. And that's why they said, God is everywhere. And thirdly, whenever they would remember them, they used to feel protected by their God or Goddess. That feeling was there, very strong. The experience would come. And therefore they said, I see God everywhere. And also, the ancient sages and saints, they wrote in the scriptures, God is everywhere because he's watching you. Don't do anything wrong because God is watching you. He's everywhere. So they wrote in the scriptures so that people should be afraid to commit sinful actions because God is watching them. They'd be punished for those sinful actions. Therefore, Baba says, actually, this was the reason in bhakti for this concept of God being omnipresent. But today, all those four reasons are not valid anymore. That love for God, that faith in God has finished. Those visions which they used to see, they don't see anymore. Thirdly, that uh, protection which they could feel, that is also no more. And fourthly, the fear is no more. Where is the fear? Some people go to a temple, to the church, to the mosque, only to pray to God, God, give me so much strength so that I may kill that person, so that I may rob that person, so that I may you know, do that wrong act. They want strength for that. So many, what do terrorists do? They do this, that thing, no? Terrorists are meant for that. They pray, of not that they don't pray. They go to the mosque, they go to the church, they'll go to the temples, yes. Everywhere, all the religious places have become places of this type for these people. And uh, it's in the law that uh, religious places should not be attacked. But so they find the greatest uh, protection in those religious places. And their prayer is only for doing the wrong actions. You mean God protects them, God helps them in that? Definitely not. But that's what they do. And when they are successful, they say, yes, God helped me. <laughs> yes. But then sometimes they are fearless because they say, yes, God, has, God will help me. But God helps those who help themselves has a very positive meaning, not, in a, not a negative meaning. The determination is there. Love for God is needed, of course. But for which actions? Those actions which are right for the soul, which have values in them, not at the cost of our values. So we should never give up our values to do anything wrong, come what may. Because if I am sticking to my values, I am with God. If I am not sticking to my values, God is away from me. So Baba says, self-respect, faith in the self, faith in Baba, determination, faith in my future, faith in the drama. All these are different methods for overcoming any type of fear. And faith in my righteous actions. If I'm doing the righteous actions, I don't have to be afraid of anything. Well, if I'm doing something wrong, the first thing will be fear in the self. That guilty conscious feeling will come because the soul is an embodiment of truth and I'm doing something against the soul. Definitely the fear will come. So, Whatever I do should be according to the, my true conscience, according to the touchings of Baba, like you heard yesterday in the class. And touchings of Baba will come only when I have no selfish motives, no selfish desires. Whatever I'm thinking should be based on what Baba has told me to do, based on Srimad, then there's no fear at all. Even if people blame me, I'm not afraid because I haven't done anything wrong. But if I do something wrong, instantly the fear will come. I may be caught, 
Maybe people will come to know, people will find out and the fear will come. And if I haven't done anything wrong, even if the blame comes, I'm not afraid. In Sindhi there's a saying, the translation comes in the English Murli. The one uh, who is truthful, who is true, he, he dances because he has no fear. But if there is any falsehood, anything wrong, anything which is against Srimad, the fear will automatically come. Of their attachments, fear will automatically come. It's, it's so natural. And therefore, I have to check at every step. Is it according to Srimad? Is it according to the values of the soul? Is it according to my self-respect? Is, is it according to Baba's instructions? So, if it is, fine. Then nothing can happen to me. Even if something happens, it will be for my benefit. So, the easiest way to overcome fear. Hmm? Any questions? Do you have any questions? Most welcome to ask questions. Or anyone to say anything, anything, any uh, experience, anything to relate about how you overcame fear? You want to ask something or say something? Uh huh. Please stand up and say. Yeah. Uh huh. Her question is, they say in bhakti that the soul chooses its parents for the next birth. Actually, chooses doesn't mean that, oh, this one I want to be my parents. But whatever karmas it does, the sanskars it creates, the soul will get the parents according to its sanskars. It will go there only. With whomever it has got the karmic accounts, it will go there. Pardon? The soul is aware of that, may not be aware of that, may not be. It's not necessary, how do you know? You can't say, okay, I want this one to be my mother, my father in my next birth. Can you do that? You know how maya comes sometimes in Brahmin children? <coughs> Among Brahmin children, we try to create relationships for the future. This is how maya comes. I will be born to you as your child in Satyug. Can you guarantee like that? Can you? Can you create relationships here that you are going to be my mother and father in Satyug and therefore I'm going to be your child now? No, at this time we're all brothers, no? All souls are brothers. No other relationship at all. But in Lokic world, the relationships which are caused are because of the sanskars or karmic accounts we are creating. And that's how they become our parents or we become their children and so on. And some people say in bhakti that God sends us, God, that you go there, you go there, you go there. It's not even like that. God is not free to do, be doing that work, you go there, you go there, no. It's all automatic. The soul has the sanskars, and according to the sanskar, the soul will go to those parents. Okay? Hello, yes? What happens to her? We give sorrow. Ah. Or oh, we go through sorrow. individual or in general sorrow. We take in sorrow. Actually, Baba says we should neither give sorrow nor take sorrow. But if somebody is taking sorrow, well, what can you do? You have not given him sorrow. But if somebody does take sorrow without our intentions or without our thoughts, I do, then it is that person's karma, no? What can you do, really? You can only give good wishes. But I have to check for myself that even if somebody tries to give me sorrow, I should not be taking sorrow. And for not taking sorrow, I have to change my consciousness, no? That's another subject. Giving and taking sorrow, or, or not giving and not taking sorrow. 
I have to change the consciousness. Somebody is blaming me, somebody is hurt, trying to hurt me. But I'm a soul, I'm different, I'm detached. And therefore, why should I take this sorrow? Even if he said something, or it doesn't affect me because I know what I am. I have my self-respect. That's what he thinks, no? It's his uh, feeling. It's not my thinking. Therefore, I don't have to take the sorrow. If somebody gives me something and I don't take it, he can force me to take it. So why should I take the sorrow? I have a choice, no? So my choice is to not take sorrow. And therefore, I take that cho I have that choice. Between the two, I have a choice to take sorrow or not to take sorrow. So if I don't want to take sorrow, nobody can thrust it upon me. But those who always take the sorrow, I'm sure it's their bad, it's their karma. What can you do? The only thing you can do is give them the good wishes. That may this soul not take the sorrow. You know? What else?